I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation to this exciting lecture series. I looked a little bit through the talks. There are so many interesting topics. I hope that I maybe can join some of them in the future also as audience. And I also want to thank to all the participants who came. So I see we have about 30, 35 people, which is a great crowd to have to talk about the topic. So I want to start straight away with the lecture. Uh, so the, the purpose of this lecture, the aim is basically twofold. I want to introduce to you the Global Environmental Justice Atlas. You can see here a screenshot on the first slide. And first, so I want to give you an introduction to that um, online database. And after that, I would like to show you also some of the research findings that are derived from this global um, database. So before that, uh, it would be great if I could know a little bit more also about you, about the audience. So I would like to invite you to, to join this live poll here. You can see in this slide uh, live poll, it's very easy. You just need to um, either scan this QR code or please go to slido.com and enter the password ejatlas.com, uh, ejatlas, nothing else. And then you should be able to vote here. So the first question would be, how familiar are you with the Global Atlas of Environmental Justice? Maybe you never have heard of it or you came across it a few times. Maybe you use it occasionally for teaching research, advocacy, whatever this would be. And perhaps you're even a super user. What that means is up to you, but that you use it quite a lot. So let's see. We have about 20 votes recorded. OK, so most of you have never heard about it. That is actually perfect. So you're the perfect audience for, the, for this uh, talk of today. So I'm happy that I can introduce to you the EJ Atlas. Let's switch to the next one. Uh, I also would like to ask you a second question, also to get you to uh, know you a little bit better. So if I would ask you um, what, in your opinion, is the most needed to move towards just and sustainable uses of the environment, let's say, towards sustainability in the future, what, was the, what would this be? For example, it could be lifestyle changes, education, just whatever comes to your mind, please, please shoot one or two words. Okay, we see quite an emphasis on education, public education, and then some other issues that are uh, equality and equity, systemic changes, minority voices, removing racism, uh, ending poverty. Okay, well, great. This is kind of, that's the, perhaps the collective theory of change that we have in this is virtual room together. So I see there's a lot of uh, emphasis on actually on social aspects, education, equity. So that's quite interesting. I want to leave it here for a moment. I want to come back uh, to that a little bit later. OK, so let me start this lecture uh, with an observation. Basically, I think most of us, if we open the newspapers nowadays, uh, we would very often, if not daily, see some uh, news about environmental protests, about people prost protesting for a better environment, for a better future against climate change and so on. So in this picture here, in this slide, you see uh, quite a lot uh, well-known environmental protests and activists. Um, you're all surely very familiar with this picture from the 1980s in the, in the United States, which were people uh, protested against landfills, which was the emergence of the US environmental justice movement. So people protested against landfills, but it was not only about landfills, it was principally about the unequal distribution of environmental benefits, such as clean air, clean water, and environmental burdens, such as pollution. Now, this kind of protests for environmental justice, they happen frequently in, in urban centers of the global north, but they are also very frequent, perhaps even more frequent in the global south, in the countryside, as you can see in all these other pictures here. So 
uh, Manuel Castells said already 20 years ago that the environmental movement may, may be perhaps the most comprehensive and influential movement of our time. And intuitively, I would say, well, I agree to that. But how can we actually know? How do we know how we see a lot of news about environmental protests, about environmental conflicts where people mobilize for other forms of resource users? But how can we know how, how frequent such kind of protests are and how influential they are? So if you look back into the 20th century, perhaps the most, um, the, the most influential social movement at the time was the labor movement. And it was very important to raise uh, labor standards. So it, it played a very important role in influencing the current working conditions. How, how influential is the, the current environmental movement? So for the labor movement in the past, there were strike statistics where you could actually um, get information about how frequent strikes are, and so you would get an idea of this. This is not the case for environmental um, protests. Well, until recently, and and here um, there's one of the main reasons or motivations for the Environmental Justice Atlas. The Environmental Justice Atlas aims to track uh, this kind of environmental strikes, if you want, environmental protests globally. So what you see here in this slide is a screenshot of the Environmental Justice Atlas. I invite you all to uh, to visit it after the talk at www.ejatlas.org. So in one sentence, the EJ Atlas is basically the largest global database on environmental conflicts and environmental movements. It was born in during a, about 10 years ago in a large research project that was the EJ project, where about more than 20 research institutions as well as civil society uh, institutions came together to discuss socio-environmental issues and there the idea for the EJ Atlas uh, was born. So on the EJ Atlas, all the different dots that you can see here are environmental conflicts where people are started to mobilize or protest against more sustainable resource users or more just resource users. So this is divided for sectors, all the orange dots, for example, they are mining conflicts, the blue one, they are hydropower conflicts or water management conflicts and so on. There is on the right side, there is a detailed filter that you can use if you want to search for, uh, for specific conflicts. Let's say you're interested in all the conflicts that are about agrotoxism. So you could apply this filter or you could also search for different outcomes. Let's say you want to look for all the conflicts where they have uh, significant, significant improvements in the project management. So you could filter for that. The EJ Atlas is, uh, has a really global approach. It, it is currently, since very recently, available in seven languages, and it aims to have a global coverage. So this is an ongoing process. You can see that there are some world regions that are quite um, densely mapped, and other regions such as Western Africa, uh, Russia, Mongolia, that um, still need some better coverage. And the idea is also that the Ichi Atlas will expand over the next ne the, the next years. Right now, we have about 3,000 360 cases registered and we know there are many more conflicts and protests and the, the idea is to expand also this database. So how is this possible? Well, it really depends on the contributors. So at the, at my institute where I work, which you can see in the on this side, in the back actually, we are a small team, about 10, 15 people that are working, that are kind of coordinating the Atlas and actively working it and coordinating also with the many collaborators that we have worldwide. So we have worldwide at least 500 collaborators, contributors um, who can um, provide information about environmental conflicts, about environmental cases, and then uh, we work together to add this information to this database. So this is the EJ Atlas in brief. As I said before, please, um, I invite you to to open it and, and look for yourselves. I want to now quickly tell you a, a little bit what were the inspirations uh, behind the idea to create create this global atlas and also the different uses that uh, for what it can be used. So in that sense, I think the each atlas really could be described as a as a big tree that has different branches of users as well as different 
roots, uh, both intellectual, academic, as well as uh, activist roots. So very briefly, uh, one of the one very important inspiration for the Ichi Atlas was clearly the, or is clearly the, both the environmental justice as a movement and environmental justice as a scholarship and the importance to look at issues of distribution in environmental benefits and burdens that arise in, uh, in projects. A second uh, quite important source of inspiration were actually previous uh, experiences in mapping of conflictive projects. So activist experiences are much older than the EG Atlas, for example, organizations like Grain or the World Rainforest Movement or Oil Watch or OCMAL, the, the Latin American Observatory of Mining Conflicts, they have been mapping conflict projects quite for a while. You can see the map that you can see here is the map produced by one of the civil society organizations, OCMAL, it's about mining conflicts. So uh, this map, uh, this kind of, uh, the reason of, of mapping conflictive project is um, quite manifold. First of all, it is you create a resource, you create access to information that could be used both for advocacy, but also to better understand what are the projects that are causing conflicts. Then it is important to not stop here. Activist mapping is not always, not often, not only about uh, getting better access to information. Often it is something about that could be termed counter mapping. So counter mapping is a term that is used in political ecology and probably more often done by activists on the ground. And this refers basically to the production of maps that show a different reality, that show the reality of voices that are often excluded. And so in, in producing counter maps, um, people challenge a dominant narrative, for example, yeah, the Ichi Atlas could be seen as a global counter map that challenges the dominant narrative of development as usual because it gives space to the voices of people that have been uh, negatively affected by this, both in social and environmental terms. Then lastly, I also want to highlight uh, the idea of the environmentalism of the poor that is also an important inspiration. It has been put forward by Joan Martinez Allier. Joan Martinez Allier is one of the co-founders of the IG Atlas together with Lea Temper. And he was actually in, at Tufts University three years ago where he received the Leontief Prize for his work on on the interrelations between the economy, society, and the environment. And the environmentalism of the poor, basically the theory or the argument is that poor people very often uh, do not degrade the environment as it has been quite frequent as an assumption, but very often they actually protect the environment. Why? Because uh, the livelihood depends on a healthy ecosystem. Think about um, fisher folk or forest dwellers or farmers in the global south. Um, their livelihood really depends on access to healthy to a healthy ecosystem. And if this is threatened, then the livelihood is threatened. So often they defend the environment out of um, these livelihood reasons. So this is also important for the Ichi Atlas because many conflict cases are um, cases of environmentalism of the poor, you could say. Nowadays, uh, this is very much discussed under the term environmental defenders, uh, which I will talk about a little bit later. So what kind of uses um, does the Ichi Atlas have? Well, first of all, it is quite self-explanatory. It is um, used in teaching, quite a lot of institutions use it in their socio-environmental classes. Then the Ichi Atlas also aims to support research on environmental conflicts as well as scholar activism. I like here the definition of Chum Boras, the editor of the Journal of Peasant Studies, who refers to scholar activism basically as any kind of research that is of high social relevance to particularly to disadvantaged groups, as well as forms of activism that are based on the use of rigorous evidence and on the use of academic skills and tools. And then lastly, uh, the Ichi Atlas is also being used in advocacy and um, activism. I want to show you here a small example. So on the Ichi Atlas, you have the uh, option, the possibility to create featured maps 
featured maps are maps that kind of make sense of the all the different points that you have there. So this is an example of a featured map about conservation conflicts in India that was recently launched um, by some of our team in Barcelona, particularly Eleonora Fanari, and together with, uh, with the Indian civil society organization Kalpabrish. So this map shows uh, conflicts that have emerged over conservation areas. These are the green dots and how these conservation areas have restricted um, community rights. So um, in such featured map, you can um, combine the information about the conflicts with additional information. For example, here you have the maps about indigenous people's land. And yeah, so this map is has been used both in advocacy and research. So it has been shared with different stakeholders in order to find ways of conservation that are also socially just, where people um, are not restricted by the rights. And it is also used in research, particularly to understand like what kind of social justice concern can also emerge in, in such conservation projects. And there's a list of other featured maps that you can um, look up in the EJ Atlas, and most of them actually come from advocacy initiatives. Okay, let me briefly walk you uh, as a last point about the EJ Atlas of how the information is gathered so that you understand a little bit better where the information about all the conflicts and protests comes from. As I said before, like the EJ Atlas really depends on collaborators uh, worldwide with whom we work together and whom who provide also information about conflicts. So who are these collaborators? Basically anybody who has good knowledge about environmental conflicts or protests can register at the EJ Atlas to provide information. So the typical profile would be probably um, most commonly academics and um, civil society organizations and activists, but then there are also other people like journalists and others. So once you have registered, uh, we would get in touch to, to discuss about with what kind of cases um, you want to add. Then you have space to add all the information about conflict cases that you know. Here it is very important um, to mention that the EG Atlas is not the place for primary research findings that you may derive from interviews or so, but all kind of information that you add uh, must be backed up by secondary sources, such as, for example, news article. This is a very important source for us, but it could be also court cases or scientific article and so on. So once all the information is added, uh, the case is sent to us to what we call moderation. And here we do a cross check of the information, whether the information is complete, whether the, the events are backed up by secondary sources and so on. And based on that, we would send it back and with some comments, maybe to say, well, here we miss a little bit of this information and that. Then there's the revision phase basically where the contributors check the comments, make some changes or add some additional information. And once all this is done, uh, the conflict gets published on the map. So this is one example, just to show you how a uh, single entry looks like. This is a case that I entered uh, myself a few years ago from Myanmar. This was a conflict that is still a conflict about the oil palm plantation. So you would have here some geospatial information about the location I would have some pictures. And then you would have uh, two pages description probably, and after that, a series of codes, which kind of commodities are involved, which kind of actors are involved and so on. And at the very end, you would have a list of references if you want to have more, to know more about this. So the each Atlas is the result of the single entries right now, 3,360. And so it's, it has been quite an effort actually to establish the EG Atlas, you can imagine, because every case is really cross checks. It's, it's a written text, a written description about the case. So during the last 10 years, what we have achieved is to cover um, 3,300 cases. So this is, uh, this is the introduction to the EG Atlas, which is the first part of the lecture. And as I said before, please visit the website and and so you can see it for yourself. I want to use now this second part of the lecture uh, to, to show you also um, some results, basically what can be done with the EG Atlas in terms of research. 
and I will do so by highlighting six global insights about environmental conflicts and environmental defenders um, that protest in such conflicts. So these um, six findings are part of a study that we published recently about half a year ago. You can look it up, it's open access, so it should be easily accessible. And it is analysis that is based of 2,743 cases of environmental conflicts, which to my knowledge is um, the largest analysis that is currently available. So you see also it's speaking me here, but there are quite a number of authors. So this really reflects all of the collective work involved in the H Atlas. Okay, so the first insight. Well, the first insight is quite general, uh, but the first point that I want to make is that environmental conflicts uh, are not, if you look at the map and see all the different cases, and we know there are many more, uh, we really can say that environmental conflicts are not just singular cases that happen because there is in some cases bad project management or lack of social corporate social responsibility. But we really see that environmental conflicts emerge rather as a systemic feature of how our current world economy is functioning. In this graph, you see the distribution of different conflict types per sectors causing the conflicts across uh, different um, income groups. So we have low income countries, lower middle, upper middle and high income countries. So what you see is that basically with the process of development, conflicts do not disappear, but they change. Different, some conflicts disappear, mainly the rural conflicts about biomass, agribusiness and so on. They are much smaller in richer countries, but there are much more conflicts about uh, urban issues such as industries, infrastructure development, waste management and so on. So development is, uh, is very often not a solution to reduce conflict, but um, very often can create also new conflicts. Um, what we see here is that, well, there are quite a number of different sectors that are involved, but there are really four sectors um, that are most frequently involved uh, or most frequently related to conflicts. These are the agribusiness sectors, biomass and land use, water management, which is ma mainly about um, large dams and hydropower, mining conflicts, uh, very common, and also fossil fuel conflicts or energy conflicts, conflicts about the extraction or processing or transportation of, of fuels. So they account globally for about two thirds of all conflicts. And they are also those conflicts that are most frequently associated with uh, repressive outcomes, such as the killing of environmental activists. So this brings me to the next point. Uh, in environmental conflicts, um, killings uh, occur quite well too often, let's say. And while we find, well, killings, killings are those facts that really make it most frequently to the headlines, and they also require urgent attention because we talk here about um, human rights violations and so on. So globally, we find them um, in thirty percent of all cases. Um, to occur, but it is also important that we look beyond killings because killings, well, they are often the tip of the iceberg of repression. So other um, varying outcomes that do require um, attention in environmental conflicts are displacement. In 21% of, of all cases, we find displacement that could be either directly related to, to projects where populations have to move to make space for projects but also indirectly when, for example, the environment is degraded and people lose their livelihoods and they have to move somewhere else. Well, violence uh, happens in 18% of cases. And then another thing, which is, I think, quite important to look at right now, which is the criminalization of activists. Criminalization of activists refers basically to the, um, to the imprisonment of activists or legal charges against activists that are not based on clear evidences or clear charges. So this is very often about um, abuse of existing laws, very often anti-terrorist laws or defamation laws that are used to delegitimize activists. And this is quite a varying trend. It's We find it in 20% of all cases, but this is something that you would find quite frequently in the news. For example, in the Philippines, 
uh, it is called dread tagging. So very often environmental activists are accused, are red tagged, which means they are accused of being either terrorists or communists or both together. You may have heard also about the recent case of Disha Ravi, the Indian activist um, that were supporting the farmer protests in India and who was also jailed because of her link to Greta Thunberg and she was accused of several issues. So criminalization is a worrying trend uh, that I think um, also requires attention in environmental conflicts. The third point that I want to make is uh, that also the impacts of conflictive projects are not equally distributed, distributed ab across different groups of, of society. So in the US environmental justice movement in the 1980s, there was the issue that, that basically people of color and people of low income faced much higher exposure to, uh, to environmental burdens. Now, if you take a global perspective, um, we are talking about indigenous people who are really much more exposed to uh, conflictive projects. So what you see here uh, is part of an ongoing research. So you're the first one actually who, who is seeing this graph. This is a map of, of the, all the lands that are currently managed by indigenous populations. This is not from the EJ Atlas, this is by, made um, by Stephen Garnett and his team who published this recently in Nature Sustainability. And on top of this map, you see all the different dots that are from the EJ Atlas that are, are represent the conflicts. So what you see here is that really quite a number of conflicts is actually located within indigenous territories. So this is particularly striking if we think that indigenous people globally more or less represent about 5% of the world population. But in the EJ Atlas, we find that they are affected in 41% of all cases that are registered. So this really shows the much higher exposure of indigenous people to uh, conflictive projects. Now, it is not only that they face a higher exposure to these projects, it is also that the outcomes in such conflicts are quite different. So what you see in this, in this graph here is basically the same graph that you have seen in the last one for the global average, the repressive outcomes, but this time it is divided for those cases where indigenous peoples are involved as protesters and those cases where indigenous people have not been involved. And a very worrying finding here is that really the number of repressive outcomes is twice as high, more or less, for those cases where Indigenous people are involved. So while assassinations occur about in 8% of all cases where people are, Indigenous people are not involved, they rise to 19%. Violence rises from 13 to 25% and criminalization from 15 to 27%. So this is really something that uh, requires a very urgent attention. I think it is uh, important uh, in two ways why, the, why we have to recognize this important role um, of indigenous people. The first one is, as, as you have seen here in this graph is um, because they really are much more frequently exposed to violence. And the second, Part is also if you consider that uh, environmental defenders do, do defend the environment from unsustainable uses like mining, mines that pollute the environment, then we see, really see that the struggle of environmental defenders is very much a struggle of indigenous people. So I think this needs to be recognized. Okay, so these three findings are, let's say, the yeah, the varying part of environmental conflicts and they do require attention. But in this last part of the lecture, I also want to look at the transformative potential of environmental conflicts. I think this, it is very important to not stop here at the, uh, at the varying parts because there are reasons of why people engage in protest, of why people engage in conflicts. So if you look back to many of the social achievements um, of the last century, like women rights, labor rights, LGTBI rights. These are all the outcomes actually of conflict and social struggles, but they are very important outcomes. So in that sense, conflicts uh, have these two sides. They have this really destructive side, but they also have a transformative side. And it is important uh, to look at both, I think, to get the full picture. 
what does this mean for environmental conflicts? What would be achievements in uh, environmental conflicts? Or in other words, what would be uh, successes in environmental conflicts and how frequently are they achieved? So uh, there's, first of all, there's not one or only one type of success. There are many different forms of success and achievements that um, environmental movements uh, achieve. They can be of social nature when, when there's a higher participation in decision making, but they can also be of environmental nature. For example, when people stop, um, are able to stop deforestation. And I want to show you here this example from Cambodia. This is the Prelang um, Community Network. Um, and they have been in conflict with illegal loggers. Uh, so Prelang is the largest um, forest, intact forest in Cambodia, and the livelihood of many people depends on it for non-timber resources, forest resources. So in this case, um, there is also a lot of illegal logging going on and people organized locally to stop this, they protested and one of the protest forms or mobilization forms is actually that they organized grassroots patrols in the forest. And in these grassroots patrols, uh, if they would encounter illegal loggers, they would confiscate uh, the chainsaws. So all what you see here are chainsaws that have been confiscated by, uh, by, by this grassroots movement. So this is a very important success for movements and successes are really important also for the survival of movement. If there wouldn't be any success, probably movements would uh, soon end. So it is important to say here, well, that these are successes, they, that they are important for both the people here because their di livelihood directly depends on these resources, but these are also successes that are important for the wider society because also even if you're not do not live in this forest as a society, as a Cambodian society, um, you benefit of the ecological features of forests. So how frequently are such forms of successes? In the EG Atlas, uh, we do not count only uh, the outcomes, the negative outcomes that you have seen before, but we also collect information about positive outcomes. And here you see a few. So the first one that is really uh, most frequently occurring is uh, a strengthening of participation. So people come together in conflicts, organize, they sometimes organize as organizations, as associations, and this helps also to in enhance the engagement uh, and uh, consultation and the participation in the development of conflictive projects. So we find this in 29% of all cases globally. Other important outcomes, positive ones, are environmental improvements. Uh, consider, for example, a mine that uh, where people protest against the pollution. Uh, these protests can frequently lead um, to to the installment of better technology to avoid pollutions, and we see these, for example, to happen in twelve percent of cases. Then a more radical achievement is uh, that the project is entirely cancelled. So also imagine the same mine, it's let's say located in, in an indigenous territory and the mine is um, completely canceled. So such things are very often victories for grassroots movement. We find this to have find in 11% uh, of cases globally. So these successes are important for the people that are mobilizing, but very often they are also important um, for the wider society because they are efforts of environmental protection. So. The fourth point that I want to make here is that um, from this perspective, and we really see this globally, grassroots environmental movements are powerful global forces uh, for just and more sustainable resource uses. I will come now to the last two points. Uh, the next question that arises in this context is, well, how are people actually able to make these achievements? And this really um, draws us to the question of how do people mobilize? So I only want to make here two short points. What you see here is a kind of the first ever statistics of protest forms that are globally used. And you see, first of all, that they're quite diverse, that there's not only one type of protest, but there are many forms of protest. There are the more conventional forms like petitions, campaigns, and street protests, and they're really also the most frequent one you can find in about 60% of all cases. Then there are other forms, uh, particularly if these um, fall short, like blockades that um, are 
bit more disruptive. So in blockades, basically you stop the entry points, for example, to a mine. But these are also very important uh, protest forms and they're also still non-violent protest forms, particularly when other mechanisms to make claims fall short. So there's a quite a number of different forms of mobilizations that are used. And the second point is that really the overwhelming, overwhelmingly, these are non-violent protest actions. So in the EG Atlas, we do also record um, the frequency of some potentially violent actions such as property damage or the threats to use arms, and they rarely occur really in cases. So consider that we look here about 3000 cases worldwide, really the, the most frequent and the yeah, the most frequent number of protest forms are non-violent protest actions. So we talk here about a diverse and overwhelmingly non-violent movement. Now, are there any other some strategies that uh, are more successful than others? Well, here in this last part, we also looked at, at different protest strategies in terms of, we specifically looked at three different protest strategy. The first one is the preventive strategy. So where protests started um, early before a project was constructed compared to, project, uh, to protests that started when a project such as the mine already started construction and so on. Then the legal strategy that is the use of any legal form of protests like as lawsuits or formal objection to uh, environmental impact assessments. And then as a third protest strategy, we were also looking at the diversification of protest. That is, um, we were looking at those cases that were using more, uh, more different protest forms that you have seen in the last slide. So highly diverse mobilizations are those that use more than 10 different protest forms. Not diverse mobilizations are those that use less than five. And what we find here uh, that, well, Basically, all three strategies are quite important to uh, enhance success for environmental movements. We use here as indicator the cancellation of projects that you have seen before, which is globally occurring in 11% of cases. Uh, when the protests were preventive, uh, this number rises to 70%, 17%. So it's arguably easier to stop a project that is not yet constructed than a project where already some money has um, gone into it. Also, the legal strategy is important, but here it's um, perhaps important to highlight that it is particularly the mix of different strategies. So lawsuits alone do not really raise the importance for to cancel a project. But if lawsuits are combined with other formal uh, contestations like objections to environmental impact assessments, then also this is up to 15 percent. And the same for diversification of protest. So really, we see a big difference between those conflicts where there are only very few protest forms, only 7% of projects could be stopped compared to those where they are, that are highly diverse. And here we have 16% of cases stopped. Now, finally, what would happen if, if, if all these three strategies would be combined? So we looked also at this and we have in the EG Atlas exactly 100 cases that were both that they are all together preventive, they use the legal strategy and they have a highly diverse form of protesting. And here we see again a big difference. So in these cases, almost 27% of, of either unsustainable or unjust projects could be canceled. So this is perhaps the most important uh, message for, for movements or for activists that really do not rely only on one strategy uh, the combination of different strategy is perhaps the most uh, most powerful form to protest. It is also this has also implications uh, for for how to support environmental defenders, because, for example, in order to mobilize preventively, well, you need quite early access to information, and this means that um, governments uh, should ensure transparency in public administrations, for example in order to be able to use legal forms of protest while access to justice must be enhanced and um, also other support mechanisms could be legal assistance, legal education, legal support and so on. Then finally, uh, the diversification of protest, um, how can you enhance diversification? Diversification, well, 
one form to do so is to seek alliances across different actors who can contribute with different skills to the movement. And then you can also use uh, different protest forms. Another form to increase diversification is also um, to learn from other conflicts. So, and for in this context, I think the EG Atlas also can offer an uh, important resource to activists because people can look up different conflict cases across the world. They can look up what kind of forms of pro protest have been used elsewhere, how effective they have been or not. So at this point, I, I do want to close. I just want to close with uh, three main messages maybe. So the first point is, if you look at all these results, well, particularly at the, at the first ones, it becomes quite, que quite clear that environmental conflicts are indeed a matter of concern because they reflect the prevalence and un of unsustainable and unjust resource uses, as well as other social concerns that are related to the environment. So they do require important attention. However, it is important also to, uh, to look at the other side of the coin. Coin. Environmental mobilizations that arise in environmental conflicts are also a source of hope because they are powerful social forces that confront these injustices and these unsustainable resource users who might democratize, democratize them and also propose new ideas and alternatives to development. And as seen also in the graph before, frequently they achieve tangible positive outcomes for people and the planet. In the very beginning of the lecture, I asked you about your theory of change and what you think is most considered. So very often when I ask this um, or in, in debates, well, we talk about why well, we need to get the policies right, we need better technologies, we need to get the market functioning right. But um, very, not very often people talk about the importance of social struggle as an, as an important part towards more just and more sustainable futures. And so I want to make this point here that I think it is very important to consider, to consider all these kinds of social struggles and movements as important forces for sustainability. Now, which role plays the Ichi Atlas in this? Well, the Ichi Atlas helps to understand these two sides of the same coin through a global perspective. And it also offers resources that uh, we hope are relevant for both academics in order to better understand environmental conflicts as well as to activists in order to perhaps better um, mobilize and learn from other conflict cases. So this is where I want to close. Thank you very much. In the background, you see uh, the team in Barcelona. And here I want to end this presentation and I'm looking forward to your questions and comments on this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Arnim. That was really insightful. And we do have a few questions. Um, so I'm going to start with the ones in the Q&A. And also, I invite everybody to, if they are more comfortable uh, using their voice, just feel free to raise your hand to ask your question. So I, I guess I, I will combine two of the questions. So Ben uh, wonders uh, what percentage of uh, environmental conflicts are represented in your atlas or uh, compared to what really is out there. And then there's another question by Shana who is wondering about uh, if there are, if what, what, where do you feel the EJ atlas is lacking in most in terms of what type of conflicts are missing or also in terms of geographical regions that are left out? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you for these questions. So starting with Ben, um, well, this is a quite difficult question. So we, I, I personally don't know it, we don't know it. The thing is, nobody knows how many conflicts, how many environmental conflicts are there in the world or how many protests. So in that sense, I'm not able, I think nobody's actually able to really uh, say, in order to know how many conflicts are there, uh, in order to know how, how much, what is the percentage of conflicts that we have covered and protest movements, well, we would need to know the conflicts that are there globally. And this is something that is really unknown, I think. So in that sense, uh, the answer is, I don't know. I, what we do know is that there are quite uh, more, many more conflicts uh, that of what we have recorded right now in the Atlas. There's also 
this is related to a lack of, of resources. It's quite a slow process, as you have seen, like you have to enter a lot of information, you have to cross check the information, you, you need collaborators across the globe. And it's for some regions we have quite well coverage and well connections and for other regions we do not have it. So in that sense, um, yeah, it is, it is an ongoing process. There are many more conflicts. Also the EG Atlas doesn't track only current conflicts. It also tracks historic ones. So it's both uh, an issue of expanding right now uh, globally, but also looking kind of about conflicts, important conflicts and outcomes have been there in the past. So in that sense, there's quite um, still some work to do, but I think still we are, uh, we have quite reached quite a big number with 3000 cases over the last three years. In that sense, how do you find collaborators? Because it seems like it's a very important component for representation here. Do you reach out to certain organizations across the globe to, to help you with this or do you wait until you are contacted or how does that work? Yes, well, it goes in both directions, as you say. Well, so sometimes we are contacted and then we establish um, collaborations and then we work together. Sometimes we reach out to different people. Uh, we started like with this big um, research project that brought together uh, 30 organizations that were quite well connected. And from this, it was in the beginning um, quite, quite easy. No, not easy, but well, yeah. We had a good start, let's say. And since then it has been going forth and back. So sometimes people contact us, but we also contact people. Uh, tomorrow we have, for example, uh, another event with, with Kali Kassan from the Philippines who contacted us. So they have a policy event. And so we also talked about sharing some of the findings, but also we will talk about how to increase the coverage of the Philippines, which is some of the countries where a lot of environmental conflicts and particularly violent conflicts are occurring. So it, yeah, it's a process that is going in, in all directions, let's say. Colin, uh, go ahead, ask your question. So some environmental conflicts are inherently um, local and others are more global, like the climate crisis. And, mm -hmm. I, and I'm wondering if you are emphasizing conflicts that are at the local level where it's a group of people protesting a local project as opposed to something that's more diffuse and global. So is the data set including both? That's my first half of the mm -hmm. question. The second half is I wonder if 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 you are to, if we were to have a data set of student protests on campus around divestment, would we be able to go to your your website and, and look to where students are active across the US? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, well, the first question is that th the focus of the each atlas is uh, local, is project based. So, so really 95% of the conflicts that are recorded are about specific projects, place based protests, place based, place based projects that have caused the conflicts and place based mobilizations. So that's, let's say, is the unit of analysis that we have in the each atlas. We do have a for some cases, there's the option to mark the conflict as a nationwide case. For example, sometimes there are conflicts about seed laws or yeah, any type of conflict or conflict where protests against a certain type of legislation that is um, coming forward. So these are kind of national conflicts. So you could register them and mark them as a national conflict and the, the interface changes a little bit. We do not have um, global conflicts in the sense that we register like different global conflict as such, but there are, let's say where this kind of global conflicts like climate change would manifest locally, uh, then this could be added as a, as a case. But yes, so the focus is really, is locally. Now uh, to your second question, if you would be able to, to find uh, your students in the EG Atlas, well, it depends. So since, as I said before, the focus is project-based, if student process uh, would be related to a specific project, let's say a mine in, in whatever, in, in the Philippines, and there's a company involved, and student would, uh, would protest for divestment in this mine, and, and we 
may enter this conflict about uh, this case about the specific mines and have the information about that are also students are protesting in Massachusetts Tufts University, then this would be added in the project description. Yes. At the time when the each atlas was made, uh, Juf was, well, it was clearly there, but not as pronounced as it is now. So we do not have a specific category to code to say, well, youth or students are the main actors, but there is ample space also for like qualitative descriptions of the conflicts and there you would add it. So in these cases, you could find them, but you would have to search for them. So we have a student, well, I suppose it's a student wondering if students can help adding projects to this atlas. Is there any opportunities for invo involvement? Um, well, yes, we do have actually for two, two ways mainly. Well, we have a number of PhD students that are working on different cases and they're also adding the, the cases to the atlas. So any, I think any student that has been, um, if you have been like closely working on a conflict in your own research, in your PhD research, or also in your master research, uh, you can get in contact with us and then you can see like what case you're talking about. If, if also, we have to coordinate because sometimes there are already cases covered, but they're not yet published and so on. But um, so the answer is yes, in principle, yes. As I said before, any person that is kind of knowledgeable about the case can can help here. And sometimes if, if people enter cases and we personally don't know so well the case, or then we would send it also to other collaborators to cross-check information and add information. So, well, yes, and then we also do internships. So it is also possible to come to Barcelona. You're all invited to come here. Are you accepting remote interns? And we also have some remote interns, exactly. Because I was thinking maybe, I wonder if you would uh, need help maybe trying to find in those conflicts uh, that you still don't know about and doing some uh, literature searches or is that kind of the things that you can get involved with? Um, yes, this is particularly relevant for, let's say, like more, not recent conflict, but let's say more historic conflicts or from the last decade or the last two decades, where there's also quite um, quite some material published about them. Could be papers, could be reports. So all this is, is very important information for the each atlas and, and can support the each atlas. So yeah, thank you for asking. I will pass your information to any student who is interested. Mm -hmm. um, there's another question, um, and I want to combine one of my own with it. So mm -hmm. the question is, can you give other examples of how researchers or activists have used the, uh, these maps to inform their work? And the mm -hmm. question the part I want to add is, uh, is there any particular question you're working on next um, after your latest paper? on mm -hmm. the EJ Atlas. Mm -hmm. um, so the first question by Ben, I think. Um, yes, there are more examples. Like I think the most, really the most concrete way of how the EJ Atlas has supported, let's say activist or advocacy initiative has been for this kind of featured maps that you have seen. So these are maps that are constructed for a very specific purpose and then they are shared with by the audience. We have about uh, 10, 15 featured maps. So a few examples um, to give you. There was one map about um, Chevron, the oil company, about conflicts that were related to Chevron in the oil extraction. So in this case, uh, people created a featured map about all the conflicts that were related to the specific company. And then I hope I recall, recall it well, or it was another featured map, but I think it was with the Chevron map. Then people actually went to the shareholder meeting to the under wallet and presented the map. So they confronted the investors with the information, putting together all this information. So this is kind of a, this is one example how activists have been using um, the featured maps. There are other featured maps that are um, a few years ago, there was this conflict about the Vale mining company in, in, in Latin America where this huge disaster where quite a number of people died. And so also here like people gathered information about 
different conflicts related to that company and also this information was shared um, also to create kind of networks across different actors that have been affected by the same company in that sense it also can help to create alliance between different actors and as i said tomorrow um, we have another advent actually in 12 hours on the other side of the planet in the philippines where where we we'll, we will discuss some of the findings and there are also there are some people from government some people from the human human united nations human rights office um who are there and the idea is there is also to discuss actually how that these different findings um could support um more practically really the, the environmental defenders on the ground and your question sarah uh, what is the next research yes well there's quite a number of different research going on so some are more geographically because well global is good because you get the global image but you lose also a lot of detail so it's also interesting to really to look at more let's say a national case the conflict in one country or thematic cases about conflicts about one specific sector so uh, there's a recent paper that came out which is about renewable energies which is i think which is quite important and we all agree that it is necessary but it is also important there are conflicts that point to the fact that also the justice issues can emerge it's not about conflicts that oppose the projects but sometimes people can dispossess get dispossessed also because of large solar power and so on so this is i think one uh, rising one uh, kind of research stream that, that we are working on Thank you so much potential and just a quick yes or no question can people mm -hmm. download data uh this this data from your website to further analyze them um or can you yes can they get in yes. touch with you to discuss this so it is so that we are currently kind of in transition let's say from let's say the long-term aim is up to make it like available open access right now it is not open access for different reasons because it's we also need to document all the fields like to be really clear what field all, all of the codes means so there's quite some work that still needs to be done and so right now the ichi atlas is open access in the sense that you can all the information is accessible online so you can look up all the conflicts you can use the filter that is really detailed and you can also extract quite a lot of information through the filter at, but in order to download the database as such, right now it's not, let's say, it's not possible in a, in a standardized way. We do share data, with, so we get requests, so people can request the data. And after request, we will discuss also with the group. Um, we will evaluate the request also, you should, yeah. It's, it's a process in which we are, but we are not yet there that say, oh, it's fully open access. Uh, to download but this is a goal that we definitely have for the future great well thank you so much um dr scheidel and thank you everybody for being here and i hope to see you next week we'll be talking about ghost uh, forest formations thank you everybody see you next week thank you very much it was a pleasure to be here